The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Jesus did come, and when He did come and when He taught, there was an assurance that came with Him that was not there. It was already written in the Bible that those prophets of old, they could not enter into His rest. They couldn't do it. That place was not for them. They could not do it. Those who were in Israel at the time prior to Christ, they did not enter into His rest. And so one immutable fact is that the prophets could not enter into His rest, though they knew it was coming. They knew that place was reserved. We are to labor to enter into His rest, but it's not a labor to make things happen in the world. It's very different. I'm going to give you a simple definition. To enter into the rest of Christ is comparable to this scenario. In life, you have things that you do. And often, we worry about things, right? We ponder about things. We say, how am I going to do this? I'm in that state right now. How do you make this happen? How can I do this? How can I do that? And Sometimes there's no solution. There's no foreseeable solution. For most folks, for the average individual, it gets to them. It really gets to them. It begins to wear down on them. They don't know what to do. It wears down on them. It takes away from the quality of their life. All sorts of things take place. And that's just no good. That is when you worry about things and your day turns to darkness. There's no promise in your life or anything else. Well, when you do that, and you've exhausted what you know how to do, the truth is, you simply can't do anything about it. Now, some people get very disturbed in these cases, and they, they do, they go into a very dark place. Believe me, I've done this before. If I did not know anything about the rest of Christ, entering into that rest, which is not what you call it, you call it something else, but it's named in the Bible as entering into his rest, I would feel somewhat defeated. I'm sharing this with you because that place of rest is real. It changes your attitude. It changes how you interact with people. It'll cause you to recoil from just about everybody and isolate yourself. It makes you feel useless. It can spawn anger and wrath and all these things. But that's not entering into his rest. That's when you truly believe that you must fix a problem. But you're the only one that can fix the problem. But if you don't find a solution that you can see, you're going to have that problem for a long time, whatever the case may be. That's not entering into his rest. So understand this, many people do this and they worry about things they have no power to change. I'm gonna say it again. They worry about things they have no power to change. Sometimes in your life, many times, you'll end up powerless. You can't change a thing. You can't do anything about it. You can exhaust everything you know how to do. But then the majority of folks, they sit down and worry about those things they have no power to change. And that puts them into a very bad position. And of course, they begin to crumble. That is not entering into his rest. In Israel and with the prophets, they carried a type of burden upon them that had no assurance to it whatsoever. The prophets were instructed to go tell a thing to the people. God required of the prophets to go tell that thing. And what did they do? They carried the burden of the people not changing and perishing anyway. Some didn't, some did. Look at the burden of Ezekiel. Look what he had to do. Jeremiah, likewise. Look what he had to do. David, likewise. Look what he had to do. And through their speech and through everything they did, they carried a burden of the people not changing. So they sat there. They, that was a lot to take. And these guys were much more robust than we are today. They couldn't enter into his rest because it was not yet full. With Christ, you can enter into his rest. Prior to Christ, God did not walk in our flesh. With Christ, God did walk in our flesh by way of his son. They carried a burden of everything they did wrong. Do you know this? That would worry me to pieces if I were accountable for everything I ever did wrong. Do you not understand how big of a burden that would be? There would be no rest, not at all. And then we enter into the situations where we do things and we get so far and we can't do anything else. And we're at the mercy of whatever it is because we have no power to change anything, right? But here it is. And I can use myself as an example. And you can read the book of Hebrews and you're going to learn all about it. First of all, the Lord requires of us what we understand to do and what we have power to do. When you're going through life and you can do things, then you do things. Whatever you do not have power to do is not on you. You're required 
to utilize everything God has put into you. It is never required of you to do what you cannot do. That is your father's area of operation. Here is the rest. Today I'm talking to you guys, but I have my hands tied. There's something I can't do anything with. Now I could worry about this thing for days, but I have no power to change it. And so guess what? Because I have no power to change it, I'm mindful about the sayings of Christ. You see, the Lord walked in our flesh, becoming very acquainted with our fears, our trepidations, what we worry about, our frailties, emotions, what drives us loony. He's highly aware. That's why the Bible states, we don't have a high priest who does not understand, I'm paraphrasing, understand on walking the earth. He was in all points tempted as we were, yet without sin. So he totally understands what we face on a day-to-day -day basis. Because of that, because he does understand. You know how you ladies sometimes, you'll say, well, no one understands where I'm coming from. The Lord Jesus does. He understands you better than you think. He knows your emotion, your emotional upset. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows how upset you are and the level of nervousness you may have. And because he knows this and you have no power to change it, and because you're bought with a price, and because you belong to the Lord, he begins to work in ways that you can't perceive of. Now, because he will do this, he requires us to be good stewards over what we have. That means we can do what we can do, what we have no power to do. How can that be your business? See, that's what he told Martha. Martha was going around worrying about this, that, and the other. He said, hey, Martha, slow down. You're worrying about everything, and that's not going to add another second to your life. And then he gave her some advice, and then he began to subtly display something that is just mind-blowing. You see, the Lord showed up like the wine. You remember the wine? Now, there are two messages with that wine. One of them is this. One of them, what I'm speaking of, you're resting in Christ, finding rest in Him, is this. They ran out of wine. Who was there when they ran out of wine? Jesus was. Did he volunteer to make change water into wine? No, he didn't. He did not volunteer. Somebody requested of him. We're out of wine. Weren't they worried? Yes, they were. And what did he do? Now, they didn't go up to Jesus and say, Jesus, can you just make this water wine? No, they were worried because they were out of wine. And Jesus, being acquainted with that worry, changed the water into wine. Oh my, the water the no good stuff that does not suit the circumstances, the water, the substance that's way over here, but you need the wine, which takes a long time to make. Wine must be refined, wine must go through processes, and they ran out of it, and they were using it for their celebration. It's not like it was life-threatening. It was not life-threatening, it was for entertainment. So why did he change the water to wine? Well, if you look at that story, his mother and some folks around there knew they were out of wine. He didn't change the water to wine to make the experience of them that much better. He did it because he was hearing the cry of those. That cry, that slightest bit of worry. Do you understand what I'm saying? He changed that water into wine, not for the sake of the entertainment value, but for the sake of the ones who panicked because they ran out. Now you're dealing with wine here, ladies and gentlemen. But who pulled the heartstrings up on the side? So when they ran around, oh, we're out of wine, what do we do now? By the way, they were just lowly servants. They didn't know what to do. Jesus heard it and did something about it. Why did he do that? To grant them rest from that worry. He could have walked off and not did it. Everything would have been fine. He still would have been holy. But that's not how he did anything. Some of his own who believed in him worried. He got a little nervous about running out of wine. They couldn't believe it happened. Jesus takes a substance, and listen, Jesus takes a substance. It's the first time I'm saying this, but we're talking about entering into his rest. So I'm using this as an example of entering into his rest. No other thing. So we're talking about people who were worried about some wine, and he changed that water into wine, not for the party, but for the comfort of those who panicked because they ran out of wine. Wine takes a long time to develop, and they ran out of it. So he takes water, a substance that's all over the place, something insignificant, and he changes it in seconds into a substance that takes probably weeks, if not months to make, depending on how you make it. Something that must be carefully made. Not only so, wine is aged to a degree. He changes it, they taste it, and the guy says, the host of the whole thing says, wait a minute, you guys saved the best wine for last. This is good stuff, is what he was saying. How does that relate to your life? Because many of you have exhausted all of what you can do. You don't have a solution. 
you don't see anybody else who can offer you a solution and you don't know what to do. To enter into his rest is to understand that he heard the cry and the trouble of your heart already. And what you were resolving your problem with prior to you running out, he will take the insignificant and make it so much better than what you ever had. Not for the sake of the problem, but for your sake, do you understand? He will do something in your life to take things away when you belong to him. Why in the world did Jesus do what he did at some sort of a celebration? I'll tell you why. Because those of whom he died for were there. Because those of whom he died for were troubled. And he did it for them, not to impress the others. They saw it as a miracle. Jesus healed people for the people. To enter end to his rest is to understand and know that we have a high priest who's heard your cry already. He's heard my cry. He knows your troubles and my troubles, and he will do something about it. See, we don't have a high priest that won't do anything about it. Jesus moved at that thing on behalf of his own. Do you know that? In fact, all throughout the word of God, he moved on behalf of his own. He did what he did so that the disciples would believe. Oh my goodness, because he said so. He actually stated that. He kept telling them they don't have enough faith. Oh, ye of little faith. He wasn't talking to the people way down the road. He was talking to the ones of whom he chose. And he did what he did so that they could believe. He even allowed them to hear. And so did the Father allow them to hear things supernaturally that almost just shocked them. He allowed them to see things. Why? For their faith. To enter into his rest is to truly understand that he will respond to the slightest things of you. He will respond. He will always be there in that area where you can't do anything about it. And he's already heard it. He's working it out. Now remember, the Messiah does everything for a purpose, a reason, and for our faith, not against us. He's not going to do anything that causes us to drift away, but somehow what he does, he does it the best way. See, we have that confidence knowing that we serve a father, that we have a father that works things out in a perfect way. And then what he delivers us, the change that comes our way is better than anything we've ever used or anything we've ever had that we've solved our problems prior to that. He heard your cry. He will move because you're bought with a price. You're alive right now today and you've not been taken from the sins that you committed in the world because God the Father said, no, that one's mine. And he's raising you. Satan cannot do to you anything he wants to do. But the Lord is working all things out in your life. They didn't have that promise with themselves a long time ago. And that's why it was said they could not enter into his rest. They did not have the confidence of the Messiah because the Messiah did not die on the cross for them yet. He died on the cross and we live in the time after the cross. So we know. Oh, and by the way, they didn't expect him to turn that water to wine, nor did they believe anybody could do it. So stop worrying about doubt. People doubted all the time. He still moved anyway, didn't they? When he was about to raise Lazarus, all of them doubted him. Did that stop him from raising Lazarus from the dead? No, it did not. It most certainly did not. There were hecklers and scoffers all around when he did certain miracles. Did that stop him from doing the miracles? No, it didn't. And he does not tire like we do. So this is the key. Do whatever you know how to do. What you have no ability to do is not your burden. And you can rest in confidence. But if you did all of what you can do, that your Lord and Savior has already heard the cry and the request of your heart before you ever spoke it. You already did that. How he takes care of it will be in a good way. Oh, to be in a good way. That is resting in him. That is a confidence in him to know that he already heard that cry. Again, when he turned that water into wine, he didn't do that for the entertainment value. No, the people of whom he died for began to have a little worry about it. They were worried about something so simple. That's a simple thing. But he gave them rest, didn't he? You know what rest is? When he gives you rest, then all your imaginative fears fade away. See, he understands that we will have imaginative fears, that we will construct these outcomes in our lives that never come to pass. And he still moves. That is our Father. That is our Lord and Savior. And he is, in fact, a good Father and we have a good Savior, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. And if he won't do that, he's highly aware of all things in your life. He's very aware. 
right? So I say, when your body cuts up and it's nervous and all these things, that's when you go to scripture. That's when you go to Hebrews. That's when you go to the word of God. That's when you encourage your soul and remind yourself of whom you serve. That's when you recall your life and say, wait a minute, look at what the Lord has delivered me out of. What is wrong with me? He delivered me out of that one. Find your worst circumstance. One will lead to another. Think of how he restored you from situations that took other people. You see, you have to be reminded. You have to remind yourself. Your situation that you survived, do you know how many people did not survive? And when you look around and you sit there and say, well, nobody can relate to this story, you better believe it because they're dead. That's why they can't relate because they didn't make it through, but you did. So then you look back on those times and say, wait a minute, my Lord delivered me from things that people did not escape and don't believe. In the contrary, you shall be delivered. That's entering into his rest. And you can absolutely 100% rest assured because you survived situations that others didn't. Do you not know some of you folks out there, you've been in predicaments that drove other people crazy. They totally went off the hill somewhere, but you have been delivered. The Lord is very attentive to all of us. And you know what, I bring this point out because a lot of people, they really think they have the pulse of Christ Jesus. Like they really think they know that They'll, they'll say things like, well, the Lord is not going to accept you in this, that, and the other. Oh, yes, he will, because he accepted us when we were sinners, didn't he? He accepted a murder. The key is believing upon Christ, it, believing upon his name to know that he is the Messiah. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that he is the Messiah? Do you really believe that he is the Messiah? Because if you really believe that he is the Messiah, then guess what? You know you're bought with a price. And if you're bought with a price, is there going to be a time that the Lord is not paying attention to you? Now, the only person who can determine if you truly believe in Christ or not in truth is you. So based upon your belief, guess what? You know he heard you already. I can't make that judgment call with another person. I've met plenty of atheists who were atheists because they were hurt, because they were missing love. Then they start hearing lunatics like me and they hear people like Angela and Pastor Scott and all these individuals and they start changing because they will start receiving love and then the healing process begins. Many people write letters and to see your tease saying that they see Jesus and the Lord in this different light. They always pictured the way, here's their words, not my words, their words. They said that people introduced God as being this huge militant father that if you mess up you're dead right they introduced christ as being this strict taskmaster that he would only love those who did everything he said this is the way people are presenting it and it's not true god the father loved us while we were yet sinners he is merciful and gracious to us all he didn't allow satan to take us out of the world back then when we were deep in sin what makes you think he's going to allow you to fall on your face and go into ruin today. Think about that. You should be dead. All of us should probably be in the pit. How many of you think you deserve life? Because if you do, you're fooling yourselves. How many of you think you deserve to go straight down there into the pit? And all truth, I do. You know why? Because the Father is perfect and I was imperfect because I disrespected the Father by abiding in sin because there were things I knew better not to do and I did them anyway. Because there were times when I enjoyed the entertainment that our Father does not like. Because there was iniquity in me, I should burn. But there are some people that truly believe they don't deserve any evil coming into their lives. You know, that, that indicates that that person does not yet see their own sin. In order to see your own sin, you must realize, I'll put it to you this way. If you perceive God as holy, you can only do so because you smell yourself, your own stench of sin. The brighter or the more holy you perceive the Lord, the more distance you're going to see between him and the deeds you have done in your life. And if that is the case, you'll never say, I deserve life. You'll say, no, I deserve death, but God gave me life. And when you do that, you're really walking around with a heart that cannot believe that despite what you did, the Lord never threw you away. Mankind will throw you away but you're still here and you have life and you believe in Christ. Our Father in heaven wanted us to go all the way back home to him, all the way. That's what he wants. So he sent his son to cover us from everything we ever did wrong or everything we could do wrong so that we can be forgiven if we repent. So when you realize that yes, you deserve death, you have a heart of repentance. Do you know that? 
But if you say, I don't deserve death, my life wasn't that bad, you don't have a heart of repentance yet. A heart of repentance is when you really realize, when you absolutely realize what you have done, how distant you were from God's holiness and truth, how you fell short in every way. You did not meet the mark and nor did I. How he gave his son and he took us from the bottom of the barrel and embraced us with clean garments and he washed us with his own blood and he stood us on our feet and he's very patient with us as we get things right and that is grace that is a good father and a good father like that always has his eyes on his children and he will never leave you nor forsake you you will never be forsaken when you're worried and troubled and all these things you feel forsaken but in truth that is a lie you are never forsaken when you're on your own and things are not going right, you feel forsaken, but that is a lie. The Father has not turned away from you. How do you know that? I'll tell you how. Because Christ is still in your desire, isn't he? So long as Christ is in your desires, your Father in heaven has not turned away from you. If you no longer desire Christ, you have been given over to a reprobate mind. But guess what? See, that's the, this is the part where you can find Satan's lies every time. Because if you desire Christ Jesus, you're not forsaken. If you desire Christ Jesus, your Father's eyes are upon you. If you desire Christ Jesus, God is keeping you by way of His Son, and you will not be lost. And it does not matter what addictions you have right now, or what you're doing right now, or what you find yourself. Men, listen to me. We try so hard, don't we? Do by strength overcome things. So let me spill the beans on all of us because I'm fairly strong. But how many times have we said, Lord, I will not do that thing again. And you find yourself doing it again. How many times do you get a little angry at someone for mistreating a female or a child? Yet, sometimes we can become angry. And if we're not careful, we'll mistreat each other. How many times have we failed ourselves, not been strong enough to keep our mouths closed? We fail too, don't we? And still yet, we have a desire for the most high and for the Lord. Don't ever sit down in defeat. Our Father in heaven has granted us so much, and none of us deserve it. All of what he has given us, he has done so by his love, not because somehow we have earned it. We did not earn anything we have. To earn something means it's balanced or it's waged against the fruit of your life. And all of us know we have rotten fruits in different places. And men, we know we have weaknesses. We're just too stubborn to admit them half the time. But in those weaknesses, in those failures, when you fall flat on your face, don't ever think God has abandoned you. Don't ever think he will not pick you up again. Use your strength to do good and not evil. Use it to provide freedom of choice and not to dominate somebody else. Use it to protect by way of love and not protect by way of harm. You can harm people by protecting. There is no way in the world you can protect one and harm the other. There is no way in the world you can defend one and put down the other. But you can use your strength to maintain yourselves and to lift another up. All these ways that we're flawed in and still the Lord will not turn away from us because that desire for Christ is in you. In Him is true rest that nothing else can offer you in your life. It's an assurance that goes beyond the beyond. And we all know the end of the story. But I give you a caution. You have to live in today. Today is the day. And I know that some of you have these problems you cannot solve. I know that you're worried about your children and situations in people's lives. I know that you have losses. But don't put limitations upon the Father and realize He hears the cries of your heart. He knows the exact worry you have. You need not hide it from Him. He knows your anger concerning things. He knows when you lose control and he's still not turned away. Do you understand? Be who the Lord has made you to be. Never put on a show in view of the Lord so that you can find rest. Open up to him. He knows already. Confession is a good thing. We confess to the Lord not to let him know because he already knows it, but to release it from ourselves. Do you know that? Do you know that? When you confess your faults one to another, do you not know that it's a relief to be able to do that? You know, the Bible says confess your faults, not your sins. Your faults one to another. A fault is something you can't get right. Say, for instance, myself, and then you have Tommy, and then you have some other men in there, and I get to them and I say, guys, I've got a fault, a big fault. What is that? Well, every time I see someone correct a child, 
I may get a little wrath thinking that they're doing it out of spite or doing it wrong. So you guys have to watch out for me. And Tommy goes, okay, I, I, can, I can deal with that. Tommy, knowing that fault, if somebody's correcting a child and he sees me walking, he may say, Brother Mike, let's go this way. Why? Because I have not yet corrected that thing in my life. See, if we confess our faults one to another, if you know my faults and I know your faults, and believe me, they're shortcomings, not sins, they're shortcomings, then you can stand in the gap for that fault that I have while the Lord is working on it. Plus, you stand as an example of how I can be, and you teach me not to have the fault. My goodness, if we could just obey the Word of God, because if you got 10 people together, each one is going to have a fault. If everybody knew everybody else's fault, each one would look out for the other. But when you look out for the other, where I would have a weakness for people correcting children because I think that maybe they're abusing. And Tommy is level-headed enough to realize the true story. I could learn from Tommy how to handle that situation through a live demonstration. And if Tommy had a weakness, or Andrew had a weakness, or somebody had a weakness, and I didn't have that weakness, they can use me as a demonstration of how they can be because we're all Christians and we all excel in specific abilities. No one person is a master of all things. We'd like to think that we were, and I don't. But each of us has a type of speciality, something the Lord put in us, something that's not even uh, fallible. You never mess up doing it. It's natural to you. And we can learn from each other doing that because the Lord knows in truth I have a weakness that something comes over me when I see women and children abused and I can't stand arguments. I don't like conflict. In truth, a big fault of mine was due to combat. Arguments lead to death. Death leaves nothing but sorrow. I'm talking about murderous death, fighting. It is not worth it. And you know, I did, when I, when I came off one specific mission, in my heart of hearts, I just said no more. I will not play a role in the violence of men anymore. It is foolishness and it's over nothing. And men die and then they're reborn and recreate the circumstances all over again and they die again. That type of confusion will never be near me and I can sniff it out from miles away. And you see that in the world a little too much. The problem is people entertain those things because they have not seen the end result of it. After they see, after they have multiple losses, when you have no one left, there's no worse thing than to have a family and that family die, all of them. We're together right now, right? Suppose we were like this for 20 more years, we would really be a family. And suppose everybody died but one of you. You would feel like you had no one in the earth, wouldn't you? When you lose something close to you, you can isolate you. Imagine if you lost your whole family in one day. That is the price of violence. So guess what? Life is precious. And who you are today is precious, isn't it? Who you are today matters. There is nothing on earth that should separate our love one to another. Nothing. There's nothing on earth worth Satan getting in between causing people to fight one another. It's unwarranted. There's nothing worth that. When a person is gone, they do not come back. They're separated from the living. And when it says rest, when the people are resting in the earth, don't think they're, when it says they're asleep in the earth, I hope that somebody investigates those terms. When they're sleeping in the earth, they have no labors of the earth. Their training is over. Their tasks are over. That's what that means. And if we can think that way, do you really think the Father would ever look away from you? No, he wouldn't. And he said he would not. And that desire that you have in yourselves for Christ, for the cross, to know him better. And yes, sometimes it gets you in trouble. And that's because you were bought with a price. Things happen to you to break your flesh so that you would never be so prosperous in the world that you would be lost. You ever wonder why your life fell apart so quick at certain stages? Most people think that's punishment. Nope, the Lord was not going to lose you to the world. So he broke your flesh, gave you an instant disdain to flesh, but your soul was never touched. You have never been touched, ever. But your flesh has. Your shopping bag has been touched. But the groceries are fully intact. And your body is the shopping bag. The contents of the shopping bag. Well, that's worth the money, not the bag. The bag is a throwaway. What's inside is what you're after. And what's inside has never been touched. You are not your flesh. You're a child of the living God. Remember that. So to enter into his rest is to simply believe him and to know him better. But he already heard your cry. And before you even cried, something was being worked out. He will respond. If he can respond to turn water into wine, can you imagine that? Then surely, when you weep of the heart, you will absolutely respond. The apostles went through many things, but never once were they abandoned. 
neither are you. To rest in him is to know that. To rest in him is to realize where you are. To be in Christ is for Christ to be in you. How do you know you're in Christ and he's in you? Because of what man can't see. Because of the spirit. Because of the soul, not because of the flesh. He's not in your flesh. And your body is not in your flesh. Your body, if the shopping bag holds the groceries, you don't have raw groceries without a package in there, do you? No, because all the contents are packaged and all the contents go inside that shopping bag. Your body constitutes the many members, housing something very holy. And you have a born again spirit that's never been defined. It may be small, but it's never defined. You are not forsaken, so rest in that. We see things as problems, but the Lord carefully introduces things to us to further free us and grow us, because in the end, we will go all the way home. Never let any man convince you that somehow the Lord will not accept you. Only Satan would say something like that. No man can speak on behalf of Yahshua that way, unless Yahshua speak through that man. And he's coming back to demonstrate once and for all. But until he does come back, let us prepare in truth. When you're worried, let's overcome that. Let's stand in the gap for each other to encourage one another not to do it. Not to chastise because they do it, but to comfort someone in the words of truth. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? if you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.